Now we're going to work some sample problems involving projectile motion. And we're actually going to start with a problem that I know a few of you have heard from me before, but I always think it's kind of a fun story, and I think problems are a little bit better if they have at least a little bit of a story, and I promise to at least try not to take too long telling the story. So, I don't think many of you know this, but when I lived in Charlottesville, a lot of my time was spent volunteering with the rescue squad in Charlottesville. And I actually volunteered as a supervisor there a lot. So late one night, I had actually gone down to one of the local nursing homes for a patient that was having chest pain. The patient wound up being pretty much okay. And I was getting back in the supervisor's car to drive back to the building and hopefully get a little bit of sleep when another call went out. And it was dispatched for a possible car accident called in by a police officer. And it was a little bit unusual to have a police officer call in a possible car accident because normally they know if a car accident has occurred or not. It turns out that the backstory to this was that this police officer was chasing a car that he initially saw speeding through a residential neighborhood in Charlottesville. He started chasing the car and they went down this one road that's a straightaway road. The car he was chasing was going a lot faster than you should through this neighborhood and the police officer finally came to a point where the road teed and he went to turn and he could not find the car he'd been chasing anywhere he thought he'd heard a crash but he couldn't see one and he couldn't find the car anywhere so he called it in as a possible car accident and just asked everyone to sort of report to his location I'm going to post a link to the YouTube video of his dashboard camera if anybody's into that type of thing. Um, but I'll tell you that when we finally got there, what we found was roughly this. So the road comes to a T. They were going straight down sort of the long part of the T. And the car was going so fast that it tried to make a right turn there, but couldn't and it flew off the end of the road and actually landed in these people's backyard. It went through their house. Interestingly, the room that this went through was actually their college age daughter's room. And at least from what we were told, she had just left to go back to school about a week earlier. And so no one was actually hurt in the house. Good part to the end of this is the driver of the car was miraculously not hurt either. So the road in this area is kind of at the same height as this house. The house sits down some and then the yard is down even further. So when the car moved along, the car left the road and once the car left the road, it really became a projectile. The car actually hit a few things in its pathway, but we're going to ignore those and we're going to just treat the car as a projectile from the moment it left the road till the moment it landed in these people's backyard. So if this intersection is 50 feet above where the car landed and the car landed 200 feet horizontally from the intersection, how fast was the car going? And we're going to figure this out using projectile motion. We're also going to go ahead and use feet and miles and seconds just because that makes a lot more sense to most of us when we think about how fast a car was going. So we know that G in meters per second squared equals 9.8 meters per second squared. In English units, it is 32.2 feet per second squared. You will not do many other problems using feet and miles. But again, I think this is kind of an interesting problem. So here's how we're going to approach it. I know that the car was not accelerating in the horizontal direction once it became a projectile, because that's kind of the definition of the projectile. But it was accelerating at negative 9.8 meters per second squared in the vertical, and I've already converted that to 32.2 feet per second squared, also downward, so it would be negative 32.2 feet per second squared in the vertical. I know the displacement in Y, so I can calculate the time it would take that car to fall 50 feet. Once I know that time, I can figure out how fast the car had to be going to travel 200 feet in that amount of time. 
once I know how fast the car was going in feet per second, I'm going to convert my answer from feet per second to miles per hour. The road is essentially horizontal there, so we're going to assume the car's initial velocity does not have a vertical component. That means that the road was traveling horizontally, it wasn't going up or down right when it left the road. So it would take the car the same time to fall 50 feet as it would if the car was just dropped. Looking at that, I can say that negative 50 feet equals v sub 0 y t, and this is going to equal to 0 because I just said the vertical component of the initial velocity was 0, just like it was dropped. If there was a ramp or the road was tilted, then I would need to include an initial y component of the velocity. But in this case, it equals to 0. That equals negative 1 half g, and remember I'm using feet and seconds squared here, so this is g in feet and seconds squared times t squared. So if I have displacement equals the initial vertical velocity times time minus one half the acceleration due to gravity times time squared. When I do a little bit of number crunching, I get that t equals 1.76 seconds. Using that value for t, I want to figure out how fast the car was going in x. So I know that the displacement in x is equal to the initial velocity in x times t. You'll notice that there's no acceleration in this equation because the acceleration is zero in the x direction in projectile motion. In all of these, we're assuming that air resistance is negligible and we don't have to worry about it. For some objects, it really is important in the real world, but for our projectile motion problems, we're going to assume that it doesn't matter. I'm going to plug and chug a little bit, put in my 200 feet for the horizontal displacement, my time of 1.76 seconds, and I get that the initial velocity in x was 113.5 feet per second. I already said that the initial velocity in y was zero, so the total initial velocity is also 113.5 feet per second. Now I want to convert that into miles per hour. So I have 113.5 feet per second times one mile over 5,280 5, feet, so feet would cancel here, times 3,600 seconds divided by one hour, so my seconds would cancel, and I get that the car was traveling 77 miles per hour. This is a residential neighborhood it was driving through. Um, if you know Charlottesville, it's down Rugby Road, right by the fraternity houses, and most of it's about a 35 mile per hour speed limit. Now we're going to have you work through a problem thinking about a human cannonball that's fired horizontally from a gun that's 45 meters above flat ground. It leaves the gun with a speed of 50 meters per second. We want to figure out how long the human cannonball remains in the air, at what horizontal distance from the firing point he or she strikes the ground, and the magnitude of the vertical component of the velocity as he or she strikes the ground. We know that after the human cannonball strikes the ground, that velocity is going to change, right? It is no longer a projectile problem once the ground is changing that acceleration. Once the object hits the ground, it is no longer a projectile. So what we want to figure out is that magnitude of the vertical component of velocity right as contact begins.